of an orphan we see pain here on earth all the hunger and starvation this world is going through the wars everywhere people dying here and there but there is hope it's not the end we Let us pray. Loving Father, this morning, we come to you time and again because we know we are so insufficient. And my prayer, Father, this morning is to ask for divine sufficiency to be my sufficiency. Let me be just a nail hanging on a wall where the picture of your son Jesus Christ is going to be put. And that as we look upon this picture, many will be attracted 
to the beauty depicted thereof. May you talk to your children today once again as we talk about the issue of morality and immorality. It's a sensitive subject, Father. But you have recorded it in the scriptures for our instruction. So as we talk about it, Father, I pray that you give me a word in season. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans 15 verse 4, the Bible says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. The construction we might is a subjunctive mood and a subjunctive mood is a mood of probability and uncertainty. That if we happen to have faith, then we might have the faith. So we are here reminding each other according to what is recorded in the scriptures so that we might have that perseverance and that we may also have the encouragement of the scriptures. Today we are looking at this uh, subject, moral purity in an age of moral impurity. I've just forgotten the one word there, moral impurity. And our leading text is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8. No, let us act immorally. As some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Paul wrote this because he has a concern among the Corinthians. And the main concept of our message this morning is that God wants a morally pure church, even though we are surrounded by a world that is immoral. God still expects moral purity out of us as God's people and as those who have been entrusted with all these germs of the truth. First and foremost, before we go into the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8 from an Old Testament point of view, let me give you a reminder the reason why Paul had to write 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8. Paul writes 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8 about the sexual immorality of the Israelites because Corinth was a city of whoredom, was a city that was uh, immoral. I told you that in Corinth there was the temple of Aphrodite. And in this temple of Aphrodite, she was the goddess of love, of, of fertility. And people would go to her temple where there were 1,000 temple prostitutes according to any historian's trouble. And they would indulge themselves in immoral activities with these 1,000 prostitutes to an extent that Corinth was like the brothel of the world then where people would travel to get to Corinth, they would do business, and after doing business, they would end up in the temple of Aphrodite. Where people would go for tourism, and they would go to cities like Laodicea, where there were the lukewarm baths and enjoy themselves. They would go to Thessalonica, but they wouldn't leave the Asia Minor without going to Corinth so that they can enjoy themselves sexually. So to Corinthianize, according to the language of the day, was to indulge in immoral activities. So Paul is seeing immorality in the church. One of the immoralities is already recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I mean chapter 5, where someone had actually taken the wife of his father and the church didn't discipline him. So when Paul is looking back in order to look forward, he wants the people that your friends, the Israelites, during the exodus, engage themselves in sexual immorality. And as a result of that, 
23,000 according to Paul, but there is a bit of a discrepancy because if you read Numbers 25, we are told of 24,000, Paul wrote 23,000, but it's a minor discrepancy. We find those discrepancies in the Bible, but it's just a number, nothing specific. So 23 or 24,000 died as a result of sexual immorality. But let me remind you that in the stories which we are studying, the sin of idolatry and sexual immorality is coming back to back time and again. Hello? Yeah. In Exodus 32, we have seen that when Israel worshipped the golden calf which Aaron made, later on they also indulged in sexual immor immorality. In Numbers 25, we are also seeing the same thing. That when they had offered sacrifices to Baal uh, Peor, according to what is recorded in the Bible, they went and conducted themselves in sexual immorality. There are two things which are coming together, and these are known as two Gs. God, as in small g, if I can put it that way, and gold. And I remember when I had just joined the ministry, very young man, and people are looking at me, and some of them are shaking their heads. Will this young man make it? And I knew the elders were worried. And I don't know if uh, uh, our chief of finance and my president and the ministerial would have been there in the committee seeing this young man who just graduated from high school is walking in with his high school certificate requesting that I be hired as a pastor. I don't know if you would have taken me. <laughs> I was just 19. And the elders were worried. Honestly speaking, I could see their worry in their eyes. One, they couldn't tell me get married because I was young. But they took a risk. <laughs> they took a risk. 2022 will be my 22nd year in the ministry. And I was ordained when I was 26. They took a risk. And okay, come and join us. I remember the workers meeting of uh, 2002. I was actually made to stand in the whole workers meeting for the whole union. And they said, the youngest pastor in Malawi union, Lubani. And I was shivering and looking at, you know, the pastors with gray hairs and the elders are there and I'm standing among them. And then one elderly pastor came to me. This morning is a very sensitive morning. And please, hold whatever feeling you have because it's going to be a very hard morning. The elder said, young man, look at me and he Say, do you look at these two things? I said, yeah, this is your pocket and this is the zip of your pants. He said, what, what's so particular about these two? He said, I said, ah, no, these two are too near to each other. <laughs> I said, so what are you trying to say? He says, be careful of this and this. <laughs> He told me these two things are taking pastors away from the gospel ministry. If you haven't stolen the tithes and whatever, then probably you get yourself engaged with a strange woman. I had never forgotten that lesson. So whenever I'm dressing up, I always remember that there are two things which are near each other. <laughs> These are the perils and the pitfalls of the ministry. If you read the book, I have told you about how the mighty are fallen. There is a language there, but I don't want to use it because we're being recorded. But if you, if you chat with me on the side, I'm going to recite to you. I have a very beautiful memory. I read, I record, and I can recall the quote. How the writer of how the mighty are fallen recorded it about 
humanity. So see me after the same one. I'll not talk about it now. I don't want to be too sensitive this morning. In Numbers 25, the Bible says, verse 1 to 3, while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices and uh, to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping Baal Peol, the Baal Peol, and the Lord's anger burned against them. I want you to do some uh, biblical intertextuality comparing scriptures here. If you look at the sequence of worship in Exodus 32, when Aaron made that idol, that god and a calf, you are going to see that the sequence of worship in Exodus 32 is the same as the sequence of worship in Numbers 25. Because we are told that in uh, Exodus 32, they worshipped the idol, and after worship, worshipping the idol, they actually uh, uh, ate, you know, after eating the, in the indulged in the immorality. Numbers 25, 1 to 3, we are shown the same sequence. Isn't the Bible amazing? What does this tell us? Aaron and the Israelites had to copy what the other nations were doing in as far as immorality is, is concerned and in as far as immorality and worshipping the gods intersect. You worship and then you indulge in immorality. And I'm just beginning to wonder what kind of a man of God we can be, what kind of a people, what kind of a Christian we can be when we worship and we are known as worshippers, we are known as prayer warriors and after that you indulge in immorality. What kind of a people can we be? Angels must marvel. What kind of a worshipper we can be? And there was immorality at Shittim. And Shittim was actually one of the last stages for the people to get to the promised land. And the whole reason why these things happened, we are told that the king of the Moabites, who is actually Be Balak, approached Balaam. And we are told by Ellen White that Balaam was the true prophet of God. He was actually the one whom God was using. But simply because of the love of the material, love of money. The Bible tells us that Balaam lost his virtue, lost his expected character as the prophet of the Lord. To an extent that even the king of the Moabites had to go to Balaam and ask him to curse this mighty nation which was approaching them. Because by this time around, Balak, the king of the Moabites, had already heard how the Israelites had defeated Arad. We're going to talk about that in the afternoon. So he is shivering. As he is shivering, he says, what shall I do? These people are mighty simply because their God is with them. So if they are successful because of their spirituality, let's also use the spiritual means in order to defeat them. And I want to tell you, my dear friends, that Satan will attack you based on the foundation where you are. As for Daniel, they saw that he was a prayerful man and prayer was used in order to trap him. We shall be trapped based on the grounds and the things we are committed to. Israel was supposed to be cursed as they, are people, they were a people blessed by the Lord. So it could not work. All the oracles which Balaam would make, all of them, they ended up blessing the children of Israel instead of cursing them. And actually one of the oracles was an announcement that Jesus Christ shall come. Because Balaam, when he saw the people of the Lord, he said, Behold, a star shall come out of Jacob, and the scepter of rulership shall be in his hand. And it is recorded in the Pentateuch. And in the Pentateuch, when these scrolls were taken to Babylon, at the time when the children of Israel were going to Babylon, the people in Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, read Numbers 
and saw the oracle that a star shall come of, of Jacob. These people were astrologers and they began to do research to find out what is, what is it all about this star. And then they realized that this was a special star. And in their study, it was not recorded. When they looked into the eastern sky, they saw a star and they began to follow. They were inspired by the Pentateuch, the scriptures, and left. Went to Jerusalem to see Jesus. It was a record from Balaam. Did you know that? And Mrs. White in the book Desire of Ages, I think it's page 60, she says that these people followed a star, but it wasn't really a star. It was a distant band of angels, but the wise men from the east were ignorant of it. Amazing. Let's leave that record aside. So Balaam has failed to curse the people. And what happens? Young ladies begin to come out of Moab. Cut walking before a people who have been slaves. Young, young, I mean young women, well perfumed. Young women, if I can use an English word which I had read at some point in time, they looked gaudy. And I don't know if you know the meaning of gaudy. G-A-W-D-Y. Gaudy. And they cut walked. Passed by time and again in front of the Israelites. And the Israelites, these who have been looking at their... Uh, women, women who are sunburned because they were working as slaves. And we see these ladies from Moab. Face creams have been used, perfumes and shampoo has been used and dressed nicely. They had no choice but to go with them. And we are told that a plague came upon the people. God demanded that all the elders and uh, the leaders of the people should be killed and everyone who had taken part in this immorality. 24,000, according to numbers, died. And we are told that as the people were praying in the temple of congregation, a man known as Zimri went to among the Moabites and picked a woman. And he was passing in front of Moses and in front of the whole congregation as the people were praying. You are not hearing me. People are praying. There is a plague that has killed 24,000. And one goes to take a prostitute. And instead of hiding, you know, of all the things one would do, instead of hiding, he passes by in front of Moses and in front of the whole congregation. So impudent, so rude, so disrespectful. And there was a man among them, Phinehas, who took a javelin and followed them to their tent and pinned both of them. And they died. And God's anger was quenched. The anger stopped. And Moses actually had spoken that Phinehas had helped the plague to stop. But I want you to see the carelessness of Zimri. Who knows that everything is not okay? He's supposed to unite with the congregation in prayer. But he did not. Now, I want to give you a perspective. If you go into the book, Ere Writings, among the last few chapters, the chapter entitled, The Shaking. Read this chapter. Mrs. White says, she saw two uh, groups of people. Both groups of people were surrounded by thick darkness. And both of them were also surrounded by angels who were wafting their wings in order to scatter the darkness. Now, one group was prayerful, but the other group, Mrs. White uses these words, the other group was indifferent in as far as prayer is concerned, careless. They didn't agonize with the rest of their friends in prayer. And the Bible, I mean, Mrs. White tells us that later on she went to see this other group which wasn't praying. And she found that the angels which were supposed to surround them had left. And she wanted to see this group which was praying. She found that the number of angels had been doubled. 
And these angels were wafting their wings in order to scatter the darkness that surrounded them. And then later on, Mrs. White went to see what has happened to the group which wasn't praying and the angels have abandoned them. She couldn't find them. So she asked her guardian, guardian angel, what has happened to them? The angel told her, this is the shaking of the people of the Lord. Oh, they had been shaken out simply because they were careless on the point of prayer. They didn't agonize with their friends in as far as prayer is concerned. Then she said, okay, fine, let me go back to the people who were so prayerful. And when she went back, she found that these people, their faces had lighted up. And they were preaching the third angel's message of Revelation 14, 8 to 12. With much zeal and confidence and boldness, they have never heard. And Mrs. White is so surprised. Why is it so? And the angel told her, this is the latter rain. The refreshing of the people of the Lord. This is the loud cry. Huh. When I read this passage is when I realized that the message of Revelation chapter 14, verse 8 to 12, will not be preached simply because we have eaten a nice meal. We will not be preached simply because the treasurer has put aside some good allowances in as far as evangelism is concerned. Ev allowances will never motivate it. But the empowering of the spirit will help us to preach the message of the third. Understand me, not three angels, but the third angel. Read for yourself the message of the third angel. That's the most critical. And if all of us can just stand up and begin to preach it, I want to tell you, it won't take a month. There will be persecution world over. Because it is the critical, very radical, and very sensitive message. The loud cry. Third angel's message. Revelation 14, verse 8 to 12. Take note of that. That message will not be motivated by food will not be motivated by allowances. It will be motivated by the outpouring of the Spirit on God's people. And it is the Spirit which will empower God's people to preach the third angel's message. Amen. I diverted a bit. That was not on my outline. But God said, talk about it. So what about modern day's immoral problem? What problems do we have? Because we have looked back, isn't it? Now we need to look forward. By, but by looking forward, we first of all look, need to look at where we are now. In as far as the modern day is concerned, this age is known in other circles as the pornographic era. Our age, the age we are living in, people may describe it in different ways, but other circles have described it as a pornographic era. Why is it called the pornographic era? It is because each and everything is described by sex or sexuality. This view of sexuality is known as the playboy view of sex, where everything is described by sex. Listen to good Adventists on a Sabbath or when there is a potluck or when there is any other event and you are coming and you are dressing and you are walking so gracefully as a child of God. They say, wow, a day. You're looking sexy. <laughs> hey, okay, so it's no longer about looking beautiful. It's no longer about looking good. The vocabulary has completely changed. You're looking sexy. Hey, so even when you are buying a barong, don't just buy a good barong, buy a sexy barong. <laughs> when you're looking for pants, don't buy these straight feet. No, 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 no. Buy the, the, the slim feet because it's about looking sexy, not looking good. <laughs> when you are shaving, when you go to the barber shop, it's not a matter of just shaving as Pastor Balizo or Pastor Lubani, who just remove all their hair no matter what happens. You must shave in a manner that you look sexy. It's not a matter of just shaving the beards. If you come among my people, now there is this style where 
you just put a line of beards ar around the mouth. And we are, when you're talking, the line is also moving like this. <laughs> because you look sexy in that way. When you're buying a car, don't just buy a car. Buy a car. And when you drive it, drive it in a sexy way. When you're sitting in it, I remember this other time I got into a car with these other young people who had a car and their father had so, so much money so they bought them a car while in the university. And the owner said, ah, guys, the way you are sitting in this car, the car is looking ugly. Sit, make the car look beautiful by the way you sit in the car. So I was like, how do you sit a car in a car so that you look beautiful and sexy? So people were putting their arms, you know, somewhere. <laughs> holding things. I said, eh, hey, okay, okay, okay. When you're walking with your wife, it's not simply a matter of walking. Vandu, vandu, vandu. No, walk in a manner that your couple looks sexy. Because that's the view of the age. Are you getting the point? I'm so observant. So these are the modern day sexual perversions. Some of them are as follows. One, pornography. Pornography is literature or publication of explicit stuff. And the internet is rife, millions of websites. And actually we are told that it's a billion dollar industry. There is also another sexual perversion which is known as exhibitionism. Exhibitionism is exposing the genitals to become sexually excited or having a strong desire to be observed by other people during the sexual act. Perversion. Wanting to be seen and then you enjoy when you are being seen indulging in immorality. There is also what is known as transvestism which is dressing in the clothing of the opposite sex. And that brings satisfaction. I don't have to talk about it in the Philippines. It's left and right, back and forth. You see it. You say that. Uh, okay. We are not condemning those who indulge with it. God loves them. But we are saying the, 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 the tra trajectory, the direction which we are going, it's not taking us anywhere. Bestiality, indulging in immorality with animals. Then there is vo. It's not. It's lo it looks like voyeurism, but it's pronounced as vovurism. And vovurism is actually practicing of watching other people engage in intimate behavior, such as undressing and sexual activity. Prostitution. You know it. It's there all over the world. Pedophilia. It's there, and actually. The music industry is also promoting prostitution more than you can think of. I'm going through pedophilia. This is uh, indulging in sexual immorality with children. Just imagine children. And I know you have heard these stories. In my country, we have seen publications in the newspapers where you hear of a man, 30, 40 years of age, to have indulged in sexual immorality with a child as young as four months, five months, five years, three years, two years. What is happening in our age is, is so uh, uh, despicable. Necrophilia, necrophilia, necros, death, philos, love. That's indulging in sexual immorality with a dead person. Yeah. It's happening in the world today. Necrophilia. And there is also what Mrs. White calls the secret vice in the writings of Mrs. White. The secret vice is actually masturbation. Incest. Indulging in, 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 in sexual immorality with a member of, of your own family. These things are happening. Now, what about alternative sexualities? Point number one, we said biblical sexuality is heterogeneous and monogamous. A man and a woman. One man, one woman. It was confirmed. Second point. Alternative sexualities are a manifestation of the great controversy. All these issues about gays, lesbianism, and all that, they are a manifestation of the great controversy. The fight that is there between Christ and Satan. Point number three, we also concluded that alternative sexualities are a perversion from the natural order which God established in the Genesis Code. Point number four, we also concluded that alternative sexualities, people who are into alternative sexualities are still candidates of heaven. Hello? 
What are we trying to say? When we say that there are still candidates of heaven, we cannot bar them from coming to church because the church is a hospital. Because in Africa, it was hard for some of them to come to church. The church in Africa is so conservative. So I said, no, they're still candidates of heaven. If there is a place where they can hear the gospel and be helped to heal, it is the church. It was also concluded that we don't need to condemn them, but they need our help. So what help should we offer? Two therapies were proposed. Spirit, a restorative therapy, which is highly scientific, but in line with our principles, and the spiritual therapy. And that we agreed during that particular time that the church, at all its levels, should make deliberate efforts to reach the alternative sexualities with better approaches up until they are restored and helped spiritually. These are the conclusions we made. Moral purity in an age of moral impurity. So what is our problem? Humanity has lost its sense of decency. And technology and the mass media as it is <coughs> have actually worsened. Excuse me. Has actually worsened the problem among us. That's why when we read the quote from J. Richard Middleton and Brian Walsh, he said that, is it imaginable that the mass media could be an agent of awakened social, cultural, and spiritual renewal rather than the one thing that most numbs us to cultural comprehensive and sleep? They asked a question. That's why we need to overtake the mass media with the gospel. We must overtake it. Churches must overtake it. Uh, unions and conferences as individuals, let's overtake the social media, so that we can help each other. Our problem and our situation. Listen to the vision which Mrs. White show, saw about us. And this is very shocking. Roger W. Kuhn writes, page 9 to 10 in this book. In the autumn of 1848, her, angels, her angel instructed her that tea, coffee, and tobacco were injurious. <coughs> Excuse me. Keep praying for me. We are injurious and even life-threatening. On February 12, 1854, she was told, Mrs. White was told, February 12, 1854, she was told that adultery was a serious problem in her church. Uh, you're not hearing me. What was she told? Adultery was... A serious problem in her church. There was also a physical, uh, a physically dangerous lack of bodily cleanliness among Sabbath keepers, but also control of appetite was solely needed among them. But let's, let us ignore the other, and let's look at the problem number one. That adultery was a serious what? Problem. I don't know here in the Philippines, but in my country, people will joke about Adventists to say, no, drinking beer, no, no, no. no. Not Adventist. Witchcraft? No, 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 no. Eating pork? Ah, an Adventist will not eat pork. But when he sees a woman, he finishes him. He finishes her. <laughs> <sighs> At first, okay, okay, okay. And then I came across this court. Then I began to doubt my own church to say, probably we have a big problem among us. I don't have scientific evidence. I didn't do research. But this is what the prophet of the Lord said. What shall we do about these things? Not about problems among us. Marital infidelity is rife not just among the church members, but to some extent there are some pastors whom we have put on hold. I don't know here in the Philippines. I don't have any record. But in my country, we have lost, we have lost some. The problem of fornication among our own children. This living in partner thing. <laughs> I know you know it. I, I is a living, living in partner. Uh, and you're comfortable. Our son or our daughter is living in. With, what is this living in partner thing? Isn't it just fornication? And if you see what it has given us 
in this society, both in my country and even here, so many single ladies who have children but no husbands. Many of them, millions actually, not just hundreds or thousands. The problem of alternative sexualities and the problem of what we call blue-collar prostitution. Do you know blue-collar prostitution? This is the kind of prostitution that is being practiced by well-educated, well-behaved, and people who are supposed to be exemplary in societies. Women driving Porsche, Porsche Cayenne. Do you know a Porsche Cayenne? One of the most expensive vehicles. People driving Ford Titanium with good monies in their account. Well respected in the society. But practicing what we call blue collar society. And now in a society where I'm coming from, where there is HIV and AIDS, the problem which we have at the moment is that sometimes at some point it just happens that a couple which has lived very healthy life all their life, they gave birth to healthy children, they just find out that they have HIV and AIDS. How did HIV get into the couple? It means that one of them, if not both of them, jumped the fence <laughs> and took the virus, bring it home. Just imagine, you have a very faithful, beautiful wife like my wife. <laughs> And you bring her the virus when she is home waiting for you to love her. Or a handsome young man like me and my wife then jumps the fence and brings the virus to me. Leaving two beautiful children to suffer because of our carelessness. How do we talk about these things when there are HIV and AIDS positive pastors? How do we talk about this when there are HIV uh, positive priests and nuns? You may say, Pastor, you, you are be beginning to become rude. I will tell you no. When I joined Malawi Adventist University, they made me to be the HIV and AIDS coordinator of the university. As such, when the National AIDS Commission of Malawi, which is the government-funded organization to handle HIV and AIDS in my country, when they would meet, they would call us a representative of you know, higher education institutions. And would also meet associations of pastors. That's when I learned that there are HIV AIDS positive nuns. I know you're shaking your heads, but I saw them with my naked eyes. HIV positive priests. I'm not being rude, I'm just talking of facts. Moral purity in an age of moral impurity. What are we going to do, my daughter, elders? We need to rise above the cloud. This morning, quickly, my time is now over. I want to give you 10 counsels. 10 quick counsels. Counsel number one, which I want to share with you, is that human sexuality is a gift from God. Amen? Amen. And it was given to deepen human sexualities or human relationships to deepen them. When your couple is sexually healthy, and you are moving about, you carry the aura of your wife. When you are sexually okay, you carry the aura of your husband. Amen. Amen. Wherever you go, God made us a male, male and female, and caused our sexuality very good, not dirty. We were to have close relationships with each other and with God. And I usually say that marriage is triangular in shape. In that, marriage is a relationship between a man and a woman. Marriage is, I mean, a man and God. And the relationship of a woman and God and the relationship of the two in God. If you are married and in your marriage there is no God, you are in a social club. My brother and my sister. You are not in a marriage in a true sense of the word. Sexuality influences the way you act. It includes feelings about your body and your appearance. If you believe that you are a sexual being, just a sexual being and not just a spiritual being, so whatever you do is sexy. The way you put money in your pocket, sexy. The way you get out of the bedroom, sexy. The way you sleep on the bed, sexy. You don't just... Sleep anyhow on your bed. No, 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 no. It influences the way you act. 
as well as ideas about the opposite sex, dating, marriage, and parenting. If you have a wrong conception about sex, it will influence the way you look at all these people and all these things. And if you are well informed with good information from God given in the scriptures about sex, it will also influence the way you act. Point number three, your view of sexuality will affect the way you express feelings of friendship, intimacy, and love. The way you act with the family members as well as with others. It will affect. If you have a wrong conception, every woman you see, you want to taste. <laughs> Busy sniffing perfumes of women everywhere. <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> and other people are like bees. Sorry, I'm so bland on that. Other people are like bees. Do you know what a bee does? It sees a beautiful flower and it goes there and it sucks all the nectar from the flower. Once it has sucked all the nectar, it flies looking for another good flower and it sucks all the nectar. Beware of bees, women. They will come, suck all your nectar and leave you dry and empty and no one will marry you. Beware of bees. And it's sad when some bees are pastoral in, in nature. Beware of bees. They sting and suck all the nectar, leave you dry. Hard sayings. Point number four. You, you build your opinions and beliefs about sexuality and sexual behavior from society. So society informs us about opinions and beliefs. Television, magazines, books, and I have just shown you how society informs people about sexuality from friends and from family members. However, it is high time we build our opinions and beliefs about sexuality and sexual behavior from God. We need to change. What has been informing our sexuality? Is it the society, the magazines, and the like? We need to, be, to base our knowledge of human sexuality according to the revealed word of God. Amen? Point number five, sexuality includes, <coughs> sexuality includes sex. It means much more than just having sex. And to other people, when you talk of sexuality, it is all about having sex. No, my daughter, no. No. Actually, there is what we call spirituality of sexuality. I wish I can have time and present that topic so that you know the spiritual aspect of spirituality where you learn that even before you can come together with your wife pray to God and say Lord thank you because of this gift we are about to enjoy thank you <laughs> amen <laughs> now you are laughing <laughs> ah. <laughs> point number six God meant for sex to be a very powerful tool of showing and deepening warmth, sensitivity, uh, and caring between a man and a woman. So God made that sex should be a powerful tool that draws a man and a woman together in a marital bond that is spiritual and acceptable before him. Point number seven, sex also expresses power. It also expresses deception. And it also uh, expresses violence. It can be lonely, empty, humiliating, and emotionally painful experience if you don't do or handle sexuality or sex very well. There are some people whose life, spiritual life, has been drained empty simply because of the power, the deception, and the violence of sex. And they will never look at a human being with respect because of how they were handled sexually. Because it is such a power, it is such a deception, and it is such a violence. Point number eight, having sex only in a unique, committed, permanent relationship, such as marriage, provides the best place for the deepest feelings of love, friendship, belonging, trust, and respect between a man and a woman. This is very important that we guard our sexuality between us as directed by God. Point number nine, sex should not express uh, should express not only feelings and sexual intimacy, but a total relationship in which emotional, intellectual, financial, physical, spiritual aspects of the two are blended together. Sex goes into all that. 
as a package. It's not one isolated thing. Are we getting the point? Point number 10. Uh, let me finish. Uh, by choosing to have sex outside of this context, which is marriage, you end up cheating yourself of a special experience uh, uh, God wants you to have with only one other person. So you cheat yourself, you cheat your society, you cheat your God, and you cheat everyone. To my ministerial director, what should pastors do? Point number one. Pastors should be encouraged, reminded, we should remind each other that spousal relationships must be made stronger again and again. I know that we are a busy people and that when everything is normal, we begin to travel and at home, the home just becomes a hotel where you just come to change clothes, to just sleep one night and the next morning you are gone. And when you calculate the time you have been at home, in a year you find that probably you have been home for only a month. And thank you, Pastor Quinto. When he was inviting me, he said, please, Pastor, if your family is around, bring all of them. Lo and behold, I said, if my family was around. But that is important, my ministerial director. Point number two, let pastors recognize their vulnerability. We are all vulnerable. Don't ever say it cannot happen to me. Because people who said it cannot happen to me, it happened to them and they are regretting. Don't say it can't happen to me. I'm going to repeat myself. Don't say it can't happen to me. When you know that you are vulnerable, then you know what to do. But if you begin to think that you are, you, you are invincible... And that you cannot fall in this particular aspect. When the temptation comes, and simply because you don't recognize your vulnerability, you fall. Last point, counseling. When the problem has gotten to a point where you can't seek counsels, please, seek counsels. And even you yourselves, when you are counseling the members of the opposite sex, the minister's manual here says, pastors are not professional counselors and they cannot and they have not been called to be such so some counseling may call for auditory but not visibility pri uh, privacy that's why in our offices sometimes it's better if you're not handling any other thing that is too private leave the door open leave the windows open are we getting the point there is a whole reason why that hole or oh, that small window on the door was put in your offices. And many times you want to hide behind. What, what, what are you hiding from? You come at IAS, all the doors of all the offices are kept open. I liked the idea. And pastors are encouraged to be ready to run. Not even pastors. All of us, even those who are watching online, be ready to run. I would like to say, friends, that uh, let's remember that we are vulnerable. And Jesus Christ, when a woman was condemned of a sexual sin, she told her, go and sin what? No more. May God forgive us if the way we have handled ourselves has disappointed Jesus. In Revelation 11, 14, verse 4, Jesus says, as John writes, these are which, those who are saved, which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These are redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Those who are going to heaven, my brothers and sisters, are virgins. Now, virgins are in two forms. There are true virgins, first class virgins, and they're technical virgins. We will not go to heaven simply because we did not indulge in spiritual immorality with Satan. We we'll go to heaven because God forgave us and restored the spiritual virginity in us. And that's how loving it is with Jesus. That's why Paul actually says, I betroth you to one man. And the man is Jesus. May God forgive us. And may we accept this call of purity in this era and age. Let us pray. Father, we had a sensitive topic this morning. Challenging one another to rise above the cloud and be pure in this era which is immoral. And I pray a lot of mercy that you help me 
You hope, my dear pastors, to recognize their vulnerability and to cultivate good relationships with you and their spouses so that together, Father, we can stand a people blessed by you. Blessed be you, see, Father, and bless all of us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Through the eyes of an orphan, we see pain here on earth. All the hunger and starvation, this world is going through. The wars everywhere, people dying here and there, but there is hope, it's not the This is not where we belong.